it's Thursday and that means it's time for another episode of your favourite royal show. That's right, it's Palace Confidential brought to you from the Mail's Kensington HQ. I'm Jo Elvin and let's kick things off with a little look at the royal family's finances. Do you hope they'll be all right? Yesterday was the annual occasion where the palaces opened their books and the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, was there to inspect them. Rebecca, welcome. Like a lot of people, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced the royals to dip into their savings, hasn't it? Yes, Joe. I had two big royal reviews to plough my way through yesterday. The first was a sovereign grant review, which is an examination of the pot of money that the Queen gets every year from uh, the government and British taxpayers to undertake her duties as head of state. Now, the headline figure there was £102 million, which is the amount of expenditure the Queen had last year. Now, there was a, that was a significant rise and it was vastly down to a 41% increase in her spending on essential building works at Buckingham Palace which are being undertaken as part of this big 10-year £369 million programme of refurbishment at the Royal Residence. Now her, her income from the Sovereign Grant remains static at just over £86 million. The amount of money she earned from other cash raising um, uh, channels such as opening the palace to members of the public, which has been severely curtailed over recent years, was much lower at £9 million in the year. All of which meant that she had to actually draw down from her reserves, which basically means dipping into her pot of savings, to the tune of about £14 million. Um, now, palace officials tell me that was entirely expected. They've been squirrelling away money they haven't used on uh, building works for a rainy day, um, and they fully expect to do it next year as well. But obviously what it tells us is that the Queen, like every big company or institution post-pandemic is slightly feeling the credit crunch, albeit on a much grander scale. And there's been an update on Harry and Meghan's financial contributions, hasn't there? Well, not so much a, an update as confirmation. Uh, the annual account showed us something that was revealed to us last year, that Harry and Meghan uh, chose to pay a lump sum of £2.4 million towards the cost of the renovations on Frogmore Cottage, their Windsor home. That uh, sum of money also included uh, some rent and uh, that covered the last financial year's rent in that. Um, so palace officials also made a point of saying that the couple said they wanted to be financially independent and credit to them, they've done that. And they classed it as what they said, a good deal for uh, the Crown Estate, a good deal for the sovereign grant and a good deal for British taxpayers. I understand you also asked questions about the investigation into alleged bullying of staff by the Duchess of Sussex, which she denies, we should point out. But what did you discover? We did, and it made the front page of uh, Thursday's Daily Mail and also our Mail Plus uh, digital edition. Uh, and what emerged yesterday is something that I have spoken about on this programme before and predicted would happen as, as far back as December last year. Uh, the report into claims that Meghan bullied staff has been buried by Buckingham Palace, effectively. Uh, they have said because uh, the review, which has now been concluded, was paid for by the palace privately and uh, they guaranteed, apparently, uh, those that spoke to them that they would, uh, their testimonies would be treated in confidence, uh, that the findings of that report and any recommendations that have been made uh, for changes to their HR policy will never be made public. Even those that took part in the report, which includes some of the people who uh, made allegations that Meghan had bullied them, allegations we should stress that she strongly denied eyes, even they haven't been told what's in the findings. And I think that will cause a great deal of consternation. Uh, people I speak to say while they're disappointed, they're not particularly surprised at what happened. And there's been the suggestion made to me that the palace have really done this because they don't want to poke the bear that is Harry and Meghan. And they seem to want uh, to uh, keep the peace with them possibly uh, to the, the, the expense of their workforce. Um, we haven't heard from Megan herself. I put in a question to her lawyers yesterday to see if they would like to make a response to this and uh, they didn't come back to me. Uh, so we don't know what she has to say about it. But uh, it, it was a big headline grabbing story today, that's for sure. And what has been the response to that? 
Well, it was something, as you can probably guess, myself and other journalists quizzed the palace on quite heavily yesterday, but they were absolutely not budging on this. There is no way the findings of this report will ever become public. Even, as I say, even those that took part in it haven't been told what the findings are. Um, and I suspect the palace really are willing to take a flurry of bad headlines and uh, television reports on the chin over the next few days in the hope that after that, the whole issue will kind of quietly wither away. And uh, I, I'm not saying this is deliberate on the part of the palace in any way, but I, I think certainly my understanding is that those that uh, contributed to this review, they're either very traumatised by what they went through, and in some cases are very fearful of their future careers if they speak out any further. So I suspect that that's something the palace will benefit out of in the fact that those involved just won't want to take this further anymore. Thank you for that, Rebecca. Another person at the palace yesterday was Kate Manzi, assistant editor of The Mail on Sunday. She's here alongside The Daily Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome to you both. Good to see you. Now, I'm going to start with you, Kate. There have been long been suggestions that the bullying investigation will get kicked into the long grass. So this development won't satisfy curious onlookers, will it? No. Well, yesterday's briefings were quite extraordinary that Last year, obviously, we heard all the allegations that there was bad behaviour by a member of the royal family against staff, <clears throat> allegations which were denied. And the palace said they were launching a review. Interestingly, they've never called it an inquiry or an investigation. That's come from the media. And as what, what is it called then? A review. A oh, review. I do love the semantics. <clears throat> a review. Yeah. And it's actually yeah. not into the allegations at the heart of it either. Uh, the palace have said it's very, very narrow. It's a review into their HR policy and, you know, how they deal with these sorts of allegations when they come up and whether they have the systems in place to listen to these sorts of allegations. This is very, this is mm. sort of classic palace speak. Mm. But I've never been at a briefing in my 20 plus years of reporting experience where something has been so comprehensively swept under the carpet. And um, maybe so many reasons for that that we can all guess at, but it's in nobody's interest really for this to come out. But not only will they not tell us what the review concluded, they won't tell us what those recommendations or conclusions, who they were shared with. So we're really none the wiser, apart from to say that at some stage there's been some sort of review into their policies and they've made some recommendations based on this. And that's the end of it. Nothing to see here. Move on. What do you make of that, Richard? I think it's. I mean, I think it's terrible for everyone, really, that's been left hanging. I mean, you could argue that it's it's very unfair to Meghan because these allegations were made publicly. They were leaked to the Times newspaper, and obviously um, she responded at the time. But they've been left hanging. There's suggestions of a sort of you know review investigation, and we don't know the results. And that that does seem a bit unfair. Well, to, and her, her to lawyers her. have always sort of you know have continually denied any wrongdoing by mm. Megan. So why do you think she would not want to, why would she not want this to progress? Well, I suppose she has her platform as well. And perhaps we might, you know, she's given an interview to Vogue magazine, hasn't she, the last couple of weeks about the abortion rights issue going on in the States at the moment. So she certainly has outlets if she wants to have her say. But I suppose the palace don't want to stir anything up. But it, it's extraordinary when you think these allegations could be made at such a high level and that the public might never know the result of the review that's been carried out. And they argue, of course, that it's private money. It's not public money that's been spent on this review. So it's not really, it's not in the public interest to release it. It's all very private, HR matters and that it's sort of It's just the public's thing. interested. Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. mm, well, arguably it is in the public interest, really, yeah. if you've got that happening in such an institution. But I think this is the, this is the interesting thing. How long can the palace keep arguing that it's its own kind of microcosm of mm. uh, of the elite of the institution it's 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 interesting how they go from where they go from here and the only person we've heard from publicly is um jason knauf the um former private secretary so it'll be very interesting to see if other well if um not so i shouldn't say other but if um supposed victims of this bullying come forward to to speak and would speak you, publicly would you mind just reminding viewers what jason said the gist 
he said that these um, claims had been put to him and he felt he had a duty to pass them on and he did that at the time, but he clearly didn't feel they were being dealt with in, in a appropriate way and that's why um, he, well then they were leaked. He, 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 it was his it, email, wasn't it? It was, it was his Jason's email, email. He was raising these concerns with somebody in his office mm. and saying, look, my concern is these aren't being, these, these allegations aren't being addressed. What worries me greatly is it just seems that the palace are falling over themselves not to upset Harry and Meghan. It, it really do. I mean, at this briefing yesterday, it sounds like they were sort of going oh. on about how grateful they were that they came over and really giving quite sort of personal details about meetings with Prince Charles and this sort of thing. They seem desperate not to upset them. And I think that's a mistake. I, I think it's understandable, though, isn't it? They just, you know, because they, it, they get upset about a lot of things and they just probably prefer to stop talking about them altogether. And there's a book coming out. Yeah. Prince Harry's memoirs coming out. So no wonder... The palace aren't keen to kind of stick their oar in. But that was interesting, actually, because there was two briefings. There was a briefing about the sovereign grant finances at the palace. And then there was a duchy of Cornwall finances. So that's Prince Charles's, you know, funds mm. with the Duchess of Cornwall. Now, they don't have to release that information, but they do so, you know, because they know that people are interested and it's of the public interest. Mm. But in that briefing, they sort of offered up that they'd had such a wonderful time with the Sussexes when they came over and that the Prince of Wales has been thrilled to meet his granddaughter, Lilibet. So there's, it did feel very much like they are trying to bring the Sussexes closer um, and... Yeah. Well, we'll be talking about Prince Charles's pennies uh, later on in the show. But speaking of, you know, the spending review, obviously the timing is what it is. It's not nobody's fault. But obviously the real world is going through a, a cost of living crisis. Do you, did you get any sense from the palace that they're keen to demonstrate restraint? Well, it was interesting in, in response to this question that everybody, everybody's feeling the pinch. And yet here we are hearing about the sort of squillions that that are being spent refurbishing the palace and that sort of thing. And the response came back that actually they are, that they, they've had a pay freeze with their staff at the palace. I sort of thought, well, you know, these people are on pretty modest salaries as it is. For them to have a pay freeze seemed pretty mean actually, and not a very good way of counteracting this criticism that lots, lots is being spent refurbishing a palace. So. It, it was only, they are looking at ways to cut costs and things like that. Well, but let's it's, hope um, they don't go on strike. We've There's got, lots of strikes we've got here seven carriages instead of eight now. <laughs> yeah. What? Courtiers on strike. I can't, I can't imagine a time that would happen, but it would be, would be a great story, wouldn't it? It really would. <laughs> they, do, they do have pretty modest salaries and, you know, most of them do it partly for the, the status and the love of it and the love of the country. So I did feel I'm pretty sorry that they're the ones bearing the brunt of it. Mm. I think it hasn't been great. I mean, we've seen you know, on the front pages today of some newspapers that are generally favourable to the royals, like the Daily Mirror, you know, they've taken a very negative stance that at a time when everyone's cutting costs, their costs have gone up. So I think it is a problem and they need to make sure that they rein in those costs in the, in the years to come. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because critics say that when Buckingham Palace releases its figures, it doesn't paint the whole picture. And here is an interview we carried out with the late author David McClure a couple of years ago on the subject. Well, as a funding system, the sovereign grant has good bits and bad bits. The good bit is that it is much simpler than the previous system. It comes from a single source and the money is guaranteed so the palace can plan efficiently for the future. The bad part is that it's over generous. Now, the problem was that it's linked to the profits of the Crown Estate. And the profits of the Crown Estate have gone up higher than the rate of inflation. Now, even David Cameron, the Prime Minister who brought in the system when he was PM, he's admitted that it was generous, which is, to say the least, an understatement. One of the weaknesses of the sovereign grant is it doesn't give the full picture of the full cost of the monarchy. Now, the reason for that is the sovereign grant doesn't include some hidden costs simple ones like the cost of local council when they have a visit from the monarchy. But the biggest hidden cost is security. That's the real elephant in the room. To be fair, the palace can't exactly give out the exact figure because if they did that, it would compromise security. For instance, you know, if it had gone down from one year to the next, it would be a green light to terrorists. But I think it is reasonable to expect them to give perhaps some ballpark figure or even say how much it was 10, 20 years ago. Because after all, it is taxpayers' money and they have a right to know where it's going. The big story out of the sovereign grant normally concerns travel because it's quite expensive. So, and actually at the end of the report, there's an annex that 
itemizes all the big expenditure. So we know, say, Prince Charles goes on a very expensive foreign tour, but they don't show us expenditure under 15,000 pounds. So there might be lots of cheaper sorts of travel to maybe slightly embarrassing destinations, or maybe the accumulation of lots of flights, you know, isn't recorded. So a lot of very interesting information literally goes under the radar. That was the author David McClure, who sadly died from cancer a couple of weeks ago. You can find his book, The Queen's True Worth, Unraveling the Public and Private Finances of Queen Elizabeth II in bookshops. Well, ostentatious displays of wealth will likely have been a topic of discussion at Clarence House this week after Prince Charles found himself the subject of an embarrassing story that over a period of four years, he had accepted bags of cash totaling two and a half million pounds from a former Qatari prime minister. This isn't, of course, the first time that His Royal Highness's charitable activities have come under scrutiny. Last year, our own Kate Manzi's series of scoops on the Cash for Honours scandal led to the resignations of Charles's longtime factotum, there's a word, Sir Michael Fawcett. Kate, I want to get into this with you and the, the Cash for Honours in a second, but what was the response yesterday to this story about Charles? They came out and said, we'll never do it again. Uh, <laughs> good to know. <laughs> yeah, good to know. Have we heard that one before. The yeah. line coming back was, that was then, this is now. And when was uh, then? It was only 2015. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a it, it was a, ta a long ago. It dark was another time. era, uh, a yeah. long time ago. Nothing to see here now. Uh, and we were told that you know n nothing similar to that has happened in the last sort of five years. Okay, um, but I mean it's such an extraordinary story, isn't it? I think you. Got... I still can't get my head around it. It's completely bizarre that that the Prince of Wales. I mean, oh, to be a fly on the wall in that room when he received a, cash, a suitcase full of cash from a Qatari sheik. And is it just simply the polite thing to do to accept that? Well, people have argued, I know Dimbleby, who's a friend of Prince Charles, has argued that perhaps it was out of politeness. Having said that, you think if, it, if he had surprised himself, surprised the heir to the throne with a suitcase full of cash, number one, there's huge security at Clarence House and bags are checked and security goes through before you get in. So you can't take a, a random suitcase in without everybody knowing what's in it. And number two, if it did happen and it was a complete surprise to the Prince of Wales, um, you think an email might go out, oh, ever so generous, but perhaps next time, you know, a check or, you know, have you heard about a bank transfer? Um, but then it was three separate occasions. And some of this cash we're led to believe was in Fortnum and Mason's Car carrier bag. Well, that's posh. The royal, that's proper posh. <laughs> the yeah. royal grocers. Yeah. I mean, it's just extraordinary that this could happen. And, you know, there's no suggestion that there's any wrongdoing, that any notes went astray. There's no suggestion there's any illegality. It all went to the charity. But that's not really the point. The point <laughs> is that it's cash being, it just looks grubby. Many people be wondering why there's a need for this practice at all. I think they will, because let's um, examine what's at the heart of this. And that is the fact that Prince Charles has a huge, sprawling charity empire. And so he needs that cash to support these charities. And then um, Prince William has uh, and Harry, they've taken on the same type of thing. So William has the royal foundation. And I must say, I think it's a mistake. But don't you think, I mean, as a royal, under public scrutiny, to, to be shown doing public duty, that's a natural... Thing for them to want oh, to do to set up charity um, foundations. No, it's fantastic that they um, work with charities. But what I'd like to see is what the Queen did and what Princess Anne has done with Save the Children and others, that they become patrons patron. or they work with existing charities. Mm. So when they have their own charities, like they've done here with Charles, it means that they have this need to get this money and then they have to rub shoulders with people, frankly, you know, often quite dubious, want to, and they see it as a way to suck up to the royals. And, it, and it's, not, it's not good. And That's I think it would be healthy if they um, st stop the Royal Foundation as well for that reason. Well, that's a great point. And it's also by starting their own charities, they're deciding what the country needs and how the country ought to be helped. Is that the best way around? Should they be listening to the people and the charities that exist already and supporting them in the community? It's good for their egos. It makes Prince Charles feel very powerful. He can support his pet causes. But I don't, I don't think it's good. And it will lead to trouble like this time and time again. Mm. Well, that is all we have time for on our show this week. My thanks to Kate Manzi, Rebecca English, David McClure, Richard Eden, and to you, of course, for watching. And we will see you next Thursday. Goodbye.